next up, there she is. Uh, we have uh, Anastasia Lauterbach, who is going to be talking about the Dana data and sustainability connection. I'm really looking forward to our discussion together, Anastasia. And I, I, I thought I would just, uh, why don't you welcome yourself to the audience? I'm doing three things in life. Uh, I sit on corporate boards uh, across uh, different geographies, uh, United States, uh, UK, and uh, continental Europe. Uh, I teach AI. I'm professor for AI and data in Potsdam in Germany. I started talking about data ethics a while ago, so it was not a very prominent subject in 2016, 2017. Uh, and this is how my journey uh, in data started. And uh, last but not least, uh, I um, advise uh, some companies in implementation of AI in, and creation of uh, data value propositions. Great. Well, so tying into this idea of sort of data, machine learning, AI, which will be the core of our discussion today, you note early in the book, you have this phrase of like what the AI imperative is is utilizing data and AI to provide benefit <laughs> to the world and safety to the world. So why don't you kick off and give a little of that sort of broad perspective of your take and your role in talking about AI in the corporate and social marketplace? So let me uh, discuss three things with you, which are very, very close to my heart. First of all, uh, this whole discussion on data and value and what it might imply for economics of a company or even of a country, of uh, a city, uh, of a nation. So that's uh, like number one. And of course, uh, we need to spend maybe two minutes on history of the Internet. So why we are where we are, uh, I think it will be helpful. Then uh, the second uh, issue, which uh, is like my... Uh, mission uh, in life right now. This is uh, how um, companies of any size, uh, not just uh, Siemens or CVS of this world, uh, big companies with big pockets can benefit from data. Um, there might be some nonprofits which might want to benefit from data. And of course, uh, they are municipalities, schools, universities, and they all have uh, data sets. So how to benefit from those? which technology might empower the usage of this data in a sustainable way, in a beneficial way. And last but not least, uh, this is kind of a, a very interdisciplinary discussion, and I would love you to jump in, because I think that just tech will not solve uh, the problem. Uh, we need uh, a broader um, portfolio of measures, which might be on the policy side, uh, it might be on the societal side, and sometimes even uh, um, a bottom-up initiative uh, will contribute to create uh, a world which is a better place for everyone. So let me just uh, kick in with uh, this kind of historical uh, paradigm. So uh, in uh, around 2000, um, top uh, German companies which uh, form an index uh, traded um, uh, publicly, DAX, uh, so those 30 top German companies uh, they had tremendous value and uh, each and every of them was much more valuable than all uh, internet companies around 2000 put together. So, you know, we had the brands uh, like Google uh, around 2000, around Amazon, etc. So those dark traditionalists, uh, Daimler, um, Munich Re, Allianz, they were much more powerful than those internet kids. But now in 2021, this uh, uh, paradigm has been turned upside down and Alphabet is now worth more in his valuation than all DAX companies put together. And the DAX as an index has uh, reached its stagnant level of 2017. So just uh, to think in terms of value creation, we might ask uh, how did it happen? And uh, one of the answers is uh, obviously because those companies discovered that we all live uh, in mirror worlds in parallel of uh, our physical world. And this mirror world is a concept from the United States. Uh, so uh, David uh, Galerta, who was a computer scientist in the United States used uh, this uh, term to describe that our life happens not just uh, uh, in our physical environment. It happens uh, in uh, social, it happens online, it happens while we interact uh, with uh, other people with means of technology. So 
the mirror's world expand and uh, we all leave traces and these traces are obviously data now to the internet internet uh, was created uh, with a set of quite uh, simple protocols which controlled the transmission of data and internet was created as a stateless place i'm not talking about state like united states or germany i'm talking about the ownership so uh, there was the saying you could be a dog on the internet and in the very early days uh, of the internet that was like that um, so the parties were exchanging uh, messages and the traces of those messages left uh, something which was all about data and then the early platform companies uh, which uh, became service providers they started to think how to monetize what was the free service and this is how uh, we came to those uh, eyeballs uh, related business model attention economy and everything which is around advertising so i will not spend any time on that <laughs> and nowadays so we have this kind of you know a value proposition which was all around transmission in technical uh, terms it was not about storage and of course data can be stored uh, centrally and it can be uh, stored in a decentralized way but historically because of uh, this attention economy and advertising um, driven business models uh, service providers started uh, to go after centralized data storage and then they started to invest in all kind of uh, all technologies, including AI and machine learning, to benefit from the insights. And this is how from a dog on the internet, we became Anastasia or Matt or Norm. So it can be traced back to us, even if our name is disguised. So uh, the proposition happened to get more and more from us and we became users, we are no longer customers. And customers are obviously uh, advertising agencies or brands. So right. the uh, phrase is right. We are the product. We are a, a piece of a product. Exactly. So and then, of course, uh, it happened that uh, certain pieces of this world got exploited. And uh, we had uh, Cambridge Analytica and we had Brexit scandal and uh, all of those issues involved uh, a data saga um, in the background. So uh, now what? Um, there are ways to change uh, this uh, story and to transform what is going on. And uh, of course, if I start discussing with uh, traditional incumbents and with brands, the complaints about why they can't benefit from data will be longer than the war and peace of Leo Tolstoy. So uh, they will tell you, uh, gosh, uh, I mean, we can't develop our own semiconductor to, uh, to be the engine of this, uh, you know, data uh, inside generation machine to process it. Uh, we can't build our own data centers. We need someone else. We can't hire all those top uh, data scientists and they, they are 10,000 in the world anyway. So. Uh, and of course, uh, we can't, uh, we aren't here reporter, we can't wave the wand and out of sudden, uh, we have the same ta uh, talent as Amazon. But uh, the question is whether we might have technologies enabling uh, that the data owners, all kind of brands, nonprofits, municipalities meet this talent somewhere and still maintain the ownership over the data. And this capability is given because uh, around 2017-18 uh, something of what was called data as a token concept got introduced and now we see the emergence of uh, decentralized data uh, markets on uh, blockchain and uh, ocean foundation created a very powerful protocols uh, to enable such a data exchange so an owner of a data set uh, going on an ocean market platform, there are a couple of others, of course, um, can get valuation for his or her data set and invite uh, all kinds of software engineering talent, data engineering talent into the equation to do something with this data. Of course, the knowledge on data as a token, token engineering needs to be pre presented uh, in uh, big incumbent companies. Uh, it's a very different approach how we think about value. But 
the maturity of technology is given. Uh, those protocols do exist. They uh, continue to evolve. And that means we have some tools to uh, change uh, the status quo. So this is something which is very, very close to my heart. Last yeah. but not least, the big uh, companies of the size of Amazon, uh, why they invested so powerfully in machine learning? Because uh, uh, data scientists uh, discovered that uh, with a, a certain amount of data, with the volume, actually it did not matter whether we had uh, an algorithm X, Y, Z. Every algorithm started to perform given a certain amount of data. And small businesses or municipalities might not sit on the treasure of a historical data set. They might have small data. So in my eyes, innovation in small data is tremendously important. We can't just uh, live in the world where we are talking just about uh, like trillions and trillions of uh, data units uh, in a data set. So this is something to that. So now coming to this interdisciplinary field, and uh, that might get more complex. So I believe, first of all, that our legal systems need to recognize that data has value. And uh, in uh, Europe, for example, in the European Renaissance, uh, scholars started to think that uh, it was not just the work in the field, or on the construction site, which brought value. They started to recognize that working with a musical instrument or writing something at your desk or uh, just uh, painting something, uh, that was a valuable uh, contribution uh, to the society. So this uh, whole concept about what brought value and what constituted work changed in the European Renaissance. So now, because, uh, our whole economy and our whole life happens not just in physical space, but in digital too. We require the recognition that data does matter. Um, and in my eyes, uh, people like me and you, we require uh, digital IDs or data IDs. Uh, and I'm thinking sometimes about um, so-called organ passports in uh, Europe. So we carry the small card uh, in our port, uh, in our wallet. And if something happens, um, doctors might recognize that we are um, donating our organs uh, in case of our uh, death to someone who might uh, suffer from an accident. Why don't we have something like a digital data ID, which might enable us to donate our data, for example, for COVID research purposes? or for CVS because they're thinking are oh, probiotics a great idea or not a great idea. And we understand that health and diet and you know food, they are really uh, interrelated. So stuff like that uh, needs to evolve. Um, and this is something where scholars uh, and practitioners from different fields need to come together and to contribute. Then uh, there's something which uh, is nationed around the world and this is data trust. And those are usually nonprofits which uh, assemble data, generate certain data as insights, and uh, do something valuable with the data. For example, in Switzerland, there's a data trust dealing with national health data. And there's another one which deals with energy data because uh, uh, Switzerland recognized that uh, by the year of 2035, um, over 50% of energy consumption of the country will be on behalf of data centers. So they try to understand what does it mean for the country and what type of technologies might contribute to the reduction of this burden and increased energy consumption uh, coming from uh, digital technologies and data centers. Uh, so data trust might be around uh, education and around food, around agriculture. It might be anything you want uh, if there is a common purpose and common mission uh, behind those. And then obviously uh, we need data literacy. So uh, probably many of your audience have kids and they just share. Uh, they share the shoe size, they share the name of their pets, they share God knows what, and this data fits a certain machines. But do they really understand that they share a certain piece of them? Maybe how they want to be perceived maybe 
uh, the real uh, them uh, when uh, they uh, engage uh, in, in those behaviors. And I think that uh, engaging kids from a very early age in some uh, data literacy uh, projects is tremendously important. Here, uh, there are very few uh, interesting solutions, and uh, I am not uh, like the huge supporter of everything China is doing in AI, but for example, in terms of data literacy and AI technologies, China is leading the world. In the kindergarten and in school, um, very basic data technologies and machine learning are compulsory subjects. In Europe, we have just Finland with a project uh, to educate uh, people on data, which is sponsored by one technology consultancy and the University of Helsinki. So the project uh, is in uh, seven European languages. Uh, it gets expanded and uh, actually the content is great and it's free of charge for everyone. But we need more of this and we need uh, this on scale coming from all corners, be it a university, um, a ministry of education or a for-profit organization uh, like uh, maybe Google or Amazon or maybe CVS. Um, last but not least, uh, I see that uh, the common technologies in data are quite environmentally unsavvy. And um, we heard already about the importance of um, CSR. So I believe that uh, the brands need to compulsory report their energy consumption on behalf of their usage of data technologies. They need this disclosure. Google talks uh, every single day about how energy savvy they are, but Google uh, spends more on energy and consumes more energy than all airlines put together. And I was on the board of EasyJet, so this is uh, a figure which is very heavy on my mind. So talking and disclosing is very important. And we are coming back to this fact that we need to invest in small data set, in technologies which are maybe outside of machine learning. Maybe it will be about uh, reintegrating symbolistic AI, bringing it back into the equation. So uh, obviously a very large playing field, and I give you a lot. <laughs> Just uh, uh, shoot me with answers and uh, some, uh, some questions. Absolutely, Anastasia. There was, you brought a lot in there to unpack about all the issues around data, machine learning, and kind of the future of business and society. I sort of, I almost don't know where to begin in the next step, but I think one key thing that's come up, um, one of my colleagues, Betsy, has brought up, right, which is the element of privacy, which you kind of talked about as tokenization. And I, I don't know that that connection was made for others, right? This idea of the shade, dare to sharing the data trusts is how do we keep the privacy part of that? And of course, we know that's also there's some different attitudes in the US versus most of the rest of the world, where in the US, there's much more comfort in companies having our data and fear of the government having our data. And the rest of the world is sort of the opposite. Yes. So maybe you can talk about where's this, where are you going to bake privacy into this democratization of data and the value that can come from it? Look, I mean, uh, uh, talk and engineering comes uh, with built in privacy because uh, so uh, token, it's not a digital file sent somewhere. Just, token and, is just clarify token, right? What you're. Ledger. Yes, in the ledger that belongs to a certain blockchain address and only those having a key so i'm giving you a key and then you can unpack it and then see what is going on but i am the owner and i can withdraw this key so it's a very different concept of course uh, our relationship of our internet can be transparent for us uh, or if we want to disclose it but this is uh, not the same procedure where we are uh, sending some packets of data and they land somewhere and getting stored uh, at some uh, service uh, provider uh, data center uh, or uh, a cloud the service provider is using for, uh, for his business. So it's a very different concept where privacy is built in. If you are not into this distributed ledger, which, which is for me actually the future, so this Web 3.0 notion, for me, it solves a lot of problem. Uh, we are still a nation. We are still not 
I, I compared sometimes to the internet around uh, 98, uh, 99. Uh, so this is for me what is going on um, in this blockchain space. Uh, but I'm very hopeful and I believe that uh, we require people of the magnitude uh, and stature of uh, probably Mark Andreessen who implemented uh, the Mosaic browser and out of sudden uh, web pages which were awful by design. I mean, uh, a normal person did not want to use internet. Out of sudden, the usage became a great experience and then we moved into all kind of UI, UX, etc. on the web. So we require in the blockchain space people with foresight and vision equal to uh, what Mark Andreessen did uh, for um, for the web um, as it used to be historically. So. But privacy is built in into the blockchain. And of course, there are other technologies with uh, normal internet, with the internet of today, which utilize privacy. So um, I, I'm not just thinking about encryption and cryptography. I'm thinking about disguising, anonymizing data sets. Uh, so we can spend hours uh, discussing those. Uh, uh, we can uh, talk about uh, how to learn on a distributed uh, or uh, make a machine learn on a distributed architecture instead of just on one uh, server. All those approaches exist. If someone uh, wants to know more, please befriend me on LinkedIn. Happy to share more information. We can geek out a bit here, but don't want to get too deep <laughs> into the geek weeds. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's this key, right? The idea of the you know, the privacy scenario, you talk about what a lot of people do, which is the idea of blockchain or maybe some future distributed ledger, using the math to create yeah. these gates of what data is shared, how long it's shared, et cetera, is this future. That's still, to your point, yes. possible, but a ways off still, yes. Uh, just one thing more. So. I am uh, just, uh, I mean, I spent so many years uh, in, in business. Uh, I was exec at Qualcomm, I was exec at Deutsche Telekom. So, I, I mean, uh, I spent many, many years in a C-suite of uh, different companies before moving into academia and into quite kind of entrepreneurship. Um, so for me, um, it's very important to be innovative and progressive instead of just reactive. And um, I read this week that there was a leak uh, to the press and to the, to the media um, in the United States and in Europe that um, a so-called GDPR for AI is being introduced in, um, in Europe. So I think that the draft of this uh, legislation will be published next week. And uh, this draft, uh, so what I read uh, now, what, what has been already leaked is uh, it banishes uh, social scoring, it banishes a lot of use cases and a lot of technologies uh, utilized in uh, contemporary machine learning. Uh, for example, everything which is around biometrics, facial recognition is more or less banned, social scoring is being banned, and uh, aggressive technologies like connected cars um, or implementing AI into surgery, they are subject to being reviewed uh, on a case by case basis. So of course, it's my question, who is going to review those? I hope not some bureaucrats in Brussels, but uh, let us see. So I support yeah. uh, this whole movement into devising of data sets. Uh, by no means, uh, I am someone who is blind towards that we are in big problems. So uh, the previous speaker talked about health. I mean, biased data sets in health is a tremendous issue. For example, women die much more uh, from certain type of uh, cancers than men because uh, data sets on which pharmaceutical based their therapeuticals and uh, drugs, they were created with male participants only. And I mean, female biology and male biology is, they are quite different. So uh, China is, uh, he has already uh, moved uh, into becoming the leader in medical AI worldwide uh, for a very simple purpose. They don't have enough doctors. They need uh, to have technologists stepping in. For example, there's just one eye doctor for 20,000 people in China. I mean, you need something else to cope. Um, but that means that certain therapies will be developed based on uh, the Chinese population 
And then we might discuss whether if the scale with brute force of math uh, into the rest of the world, whether we will not have certain issues health wise. And this is nothing against China. This is just uh, it's just yeah. statistical issue right. and it's it's there. But I think that just forbidding something without giving a vision and encouraging uh, innovation, this will not solve the problem. And I am very worried that additional uh, legislation will bring out, uh, squeeze out talent, which we need in Europe, um, and they will move uh, somewhere else. Uh, so this is something which is very wor worrisome for me. And uh, I mean, big tech, they have uh, all money uh, and resources in the world to spend on lobbying and to spend on new technologies. I am not worried about them. I am worried about small guys. Yeah, I mean, and that is, there's a natural tension uh, to help those without the big data sets. We hosted um, uh, Amy Webb, who has written the book, The Big Nine, a couple of years ago at the Bright Conference, and is very much, you know, so obviously a lot of that book is exactly at what you're getting at. And you include some of that in the AI imperative as well. You sort of were both coming to similar things of how do we take the big data companies and not have them essentially control the future of AI and ML. Um, and you've also brought up another great point. You used it with China, but we're seeing it right more and more with all sorts of examples of where the data sets used for the AI models are have natural bias themselves, whether it's because okay. the humans who created the data were biased, because the choice of the data sets by the designers who crafted them were biased, or as we saw in MIT recently with some of these core data sets around natural language processing uh, and image recognition, where just, you know, the training, the data itself was flawed where like the human being mistook a cat for a, a ferret or whatever. And so now these models are being built with these percentage errors in the data. So, all, and that, again, they're not easy fixes. They're not gonna happen immediately, um, but it's a matter of, right, how do you create more data and more parties involved? Um, I know you're passionate about this other, another issue that's come up of like, as we talk about data and AI, and you mentioned it already, Google reporting its, you know, environmental impact. I mean, where do you see that so that level of sustainability moving, and can it be done on the data and engineering end, or are we really going to need to have changes in energy production, solar power, et cetera, that are the only way we're going to balance the full benefit that can be had from yeah from using I data and AI. They will not be just one answer coming from one corner. So uh, obviously we are in a very interdisciplinary world, but thankfully uh, they, there is expertise uh, coming from all kinds of corners. So we need to work on transparency and disclosure because it educates, uh, it's like it rings a bell and it drives attention. Then of course we need to, uh, to work on, uh, on energy sources which are just uh, more environmentally friendly. And uh, if there is something to share, even from the part of Amazons and Googles of this world, this is great because they use renewables. So they have been using them uh, for ages. Um, so that's all uh, pays into this. And uh, it will not be solved overnight, but uh, I am just kind of, you know, warning uh, that if we cut corners with just a punitive uh, legislation, it will not solve the problem. And the legislation, so this uh, GDPR for AI, it uh, actually quotes the same uh, fine um, for uh, violation of the new rules, which is 4% uh, of global revenues. It's very similar to what we experienced uh, in the original GDPR. And I'm a huge supporter of privacy. I'm a huge supporter of de-biased data sets, etc. So this is not about that. I am just, please, just give a certain a uh, framework for funding, for investing into something which is sustainable and good and healthy for the society, not just working with uh, what we already have, but think about the future. And I think that uh, right now we lack those discussions. I am not hearing you any yep, longer. The, 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 the meme continues, you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> 
So uh, we do have to wrap up, uh, Anastasia, move on to our next speakers. I did see a comment and I, I mean, maybe I'll just take this quickly, right? People are asking, hey, if you are a small company, how do you get to this? And I, I think there are resources out there, right? The Google, the reality is as much as the, you know, Amazon and the Googles of the world have a lot of power and a lot of the data, they are also open source and sharing a lot of the technologies I played around in a class uh, that I was doing around AI and marketing with uh, Google has a platform called uh, Thinking Machines, where I built my own little image recognition platform with that. So that's the recommendation to those of you who are in small business. Look, you, there are a lot of tools available for that. Absolutely. Um, and then I'd like to end with you, Anastasia, with a just you know a little personal thing, right? What's your favorite? you know, AI machine learning thing for your, it could be professional, but I'm guessing more like personal life. What do you see where you're like, this is, this makes me proud and hopeful about the future of where this could all go. Oh gosh, uh, really, that, that's a very difficult question because uh, I mean, I use a bunch of those and I am, I'm in love with uh, so many, uh, but frankly, uh, I, I just want to, uh, kind of, you know, raise the flag again for this uh, ocean data market, uh, which uh, I use a lot in my very concrete uh, work to build um, distributed data markets and to offer this opportunity. I just think it's a brilliant piece of engineering. It uh, would take too much time to deep dive the architecture, but it's just a brilliant piece of engineering provided by the, by the way, by former AI entrepreneurs. So this is something I'm a huge believer in that. And uh, on another hand, uh, you know, there are so many helpful applications for AI in computer vision. Uh, I mean, those machines, uh, computer vision technology is just so great nowadays, recognizing small pixel and out of sudden uh, there is a diagnose uh, of a tumor and the human eye can't recognize it. And of course, we need a human uh, in the loop with all the expertise. but. Just seeing it uh, for breast cancers, for brain cancer. So in, in my uh, practice in companies I'm interacting in, this makes me so hopeful um, when humans and machines interact in a very healthy and sustainable way.